the twin paradox is still a popular problem because it gives us such a great perspective on relativity. There are different ways to get exactly the same answer. And there are two things that I want to show you today. One is the contrast between the approaches of Richard Feynman and Tim Maudlin. The second is the modern science fiction story of interstellar travel that clears up some important details. Now, uh, Richard Feynman was a, a physicist who worked, did a lot of work in the 60s and 70s and won the Nobel Prize. Tim Maudlin is a philosophy professor who's written the books recently. Here's a simplified version of the this, this twin story. Alice and Bob are the twins. Alice is going on an exploratory trip out four year lot, light years away and then back while Bob stays home on Earth. Alice has a super duper rocket that accelerates from zero to 80% of the speed of light almost instantaneously, we'll say a fraction of a second. Also, it decelerates to a complete stop in the same amount of time. So here she, here's the trip. She goes out for, um, to four light years away and then she immediately turns around and comes back and Bob calculates that it takes her five years to make the journey each way. So that's a total of 10 years that she's gonna be gone on the trip. That's in Bob's reference frame. Now, relativity tells us that, that Alice is gonna come back because the relativistic time dilation, she's gonna come back younger than Bob is. And the paradox comes from what people were saying back in the 60s, that all motion is relative. So they said from Alice's reference frame, Bob is the one who goes away and comes back. So maybe he should be younger. How could, uh, how could this be? Okay, let me show you what Richard Feynman wrote in his book, the Feynman Lecture Series. This was in 1963. He says, the one who has felt the accelerations is the one who would be younger. That is the difference between them in an absolute sense, and it's certainly correct. Then he goes on to describe experimental evidence. Of course, we don't have super duper rockets, but we do have ways to test relativity. For example, we can produce unstable particles in the lab, in the accelerators at CERN or wherever, and we can accelerate them around and around in a circle. The ones that are accelerated in a circle live longer than the ones that are just sitting in the lab you know, for the same type of particle. So he tells us that you know, acceleration is, is what makes a difference. At the time I read that, a long time ago, I knew just a little bit about general relativity. The equivalence principle of general relativity tells us that acceleration has the same physical effects as a uniform gravitational field. And I thought, oh yes, gravity slows down uh, clocks. So that's why the GPS satellites have to have their clock corrected for the Earth's gravity. And if you get close to a black hole, what we've always heard, we've never tried this, but what we've always heard is that the clock slowed down to actually zero at the uh, event horizon. I said, oh, okay, it's the acceleration that, that, uh, that makes the difference in the twin paradox. After that, I went on to uh, do research in physical chemistry. And so it was a long time later when I decided to read some more about relativity. And then I came across Tim Maudlin's book, Philosophy of Physics, Space and Time. I'll put all the references in the uh, description for you. Well, the first thing that Maudlin had to say about relativity was, special relativity is a very simple theory that is commonly presented in a complex and confusing way. Well, I certainly agree that when I was in college, relativity was presented in a very complicated, complex and confusing way. He's got that part right. I went on to read with great interest what he has to say. First, he quotes all everything that Feynman said about the twin paradox, and he says, everything in this explanation is wrong. I was astounded to see somebody correcting Feynman on his physics. So I read with great interest what else Baldwin had to say. 
it turns out he gave us a very simple way to, to do the relativity calculations. And I wish somebody had told me this back when I was in college. Okay, first, let's take a look at the space-time diagram. It was also called the Minkowski diagram of the uh, trip through, on the rock, in the super duper rocket. Okay, this is a little different from what we see in everyday life because the time axis is vertical and the space axis is horizontal. We always have to go forward in time, of course, and then we can also move back and forth in space. So Alice's total uh, trip looks like, like this. Now to calculate what the time for her is, is uh, Maldon tells us use the space-time interval because the interval is the same, it's invariant, it's the same in any inertial reference frame. And that's an ordinary reference frame that's, that's not accelerated. For, um, for straight lines, as we see on Alice's trip, this is, this is really easy. We just need to uh, define what's event one and event two. Okay, event one is gonna be when Alice takes off. Event two is when she gets to the farthest point of her trip and turns around. And then here, here I mark them on the Minkowski diagram. It's very easy to calculate the space-time interval in Bob's reference frame. Just plug in the numbers and we'll see delta S equals three years. This is so much easier than using Lorentz transformation. And it gives you the same answer. You can check and see if you want to. Now when we go to Alice's re reference frame, the interval has to be the same, but there's no delta X. In her frame, she's at rest, she's not moving. And so the entire interval has to be due to the passage of time for her. And so that's three years. Now, that was, the, that was the outbound trip. The inbound trip is the same way. We just say event two is going to be the time she turns around, and event three is the time she comes back home. And so we end up with three plus three for Alice is six years, and five plus five is uh, 10 years for Bob. Now, notice we didn't have to know anything about acceleration to do those calculations. And Tim Maudlin goes on to say, we could give Bob the same acceleration or even more acceleration than Alice and she would still come back younger than him. I read that and thought, what in the world? Okay, here's how to do it. Suppose Bob has another one of those super duper rockets, but he's just going on a short trip to the moon and back. If you're going 80% of the speed of life the whole way there and back, that would take about two seconds. And remember, he can accelerate and decelerate in just a tiny fraction of a second. So in that case, how much time did Bob spend on Earth? Well, 10 years minus about two seconds. So he still aged to 10 years. But when he took off and when he turned around and when he landed, he had all the accelerations that Alice had. And to give him more acceleration, he can make two or three trips to the moon and back. And it really makes no difference at all, you know. It's the, it's the total path through space-time that determines what the, what's on the clock. Now, modern science fiction gives us another story of how you could go, you know, several light years away. Uh, this, this, this clears up some problems because if you had a super-duper rocket that could accelerate so instantaneously, to, there's all kinds of practical problems. To start with, it would kill the astronauts. However, you could theoretically accelerate, uh, say you're going up four light years, you accelerate until you get halfway there, two light years, then you turn the rocket around and then decelerate for your second half of the trip. The return home is just the mirror image of that. That way the astronauts always feel very comfortable at 1G, it's just like being at home. Now the calculations for that are certainly more complicated than doing just the simple trip that we usually use, but we don't have to do those ourselves. They've already been worked out, and again, I'll put the reference in the uh, description. Here's the picture on the space-time di diagram of the, um, of the modern trip 
and also the uh, compared to the uh, very simple trip. So it turns out if you do that acceleration at 1G for the whole whole time, then Alice ages 6.8 years and Bob ages 11.2 years. And these are remarkably similar. I was surprised that you could get such uh, such good results getting out to another star system just at 1G acceleration. That's how the math comes out. What we see is that even with exactly the same acceleration, Bob and Alice both experienced 1G acceleration for the entire time of the trip, and she came back four years younger than him. How could that happen? Was Feynman wrong? Well, I had to go back and check on that. You know, let's get Feynman's book out here again. I reread what he had to say, and you know, Feynman never really told us that acceleration causes the change in, in time, that, or acceleration causes a person to come back younger. He just took a shortcut telling us that acceleration is absolute. So it's not true that all motion is, is relative. It's only motion at constant velocity that's relative. So I don't think he was wrong, but he did confuse the heck out of the generation of young scientists. I think this needs to be a lesson to all of us who try to communicate science. We need to be careful about our shortcuts. So I hope I don't make any uh, mistakes like that. And I really appreciate you watching.